Wise Guy, Life in a Mafia Family by Nicholas Pileggi. This is the biography of Henry Hill. The author says Hill was a hood, a hustler. He schemed and plotted and broke heads. He knew who to bribe and he knew how to con. He was a full-time racketeer. On the street, he and his friends were known as wise guys. This book inspired the movie Goodfellas, starring Ray Liotta, Robert De Niro, and Joe Pesci. It's one of the greatest mob movies of all time, in my opinion. Hill was associated with the Lucci's crime family out of New York. He could never be a made man because his father was Irish and his mother was Sicilian. He wasn't full-blooded Italian. This didn't mean he couldn't work for them, though. He was part of a crew of criminals who were involved in hijackings, fixed basketball games, illegal gambling, drugs and weapons trafficking, and so forth. When Hill was a kid, he would look out his bedroom window and see men in silk suits, diamond rings, and expensive cars. They met at the Euclid Avenue taxi cab and limousine service. This was also a meeting place for horse players, lawyers, bookies, handicappers, ex-jockeys, parole violators, construction workers, union officials, local politicians, loan sharks, off-duty cops, and even retired hitmen. Hill was introduced to life in a mafia at the age of 11 years old when he started an after-school job at a cab stand owned by Paul Vario. Vario was a ranking member of the Lucci's family and an up-and-coming mafia star who had been in and out of jail for most of his life. He ruled over the Brownsville East section of New York. The problem Hill's parents had with his new job is that he was always there. He even skipped school to be there. One time, his parents got a letter from Henry's school stating that he hadn't been there in weeks, so his father beat him. Let me say this. His father was a beta male cuck, ballless and cowardly. He beat Henry because he hated the world. Anybody who beats their kids is a non-human in my eyes. Henry's response to this was, everybody has to take a beating sometime. The truth is, Henry had dyslexia. At age 12, Hill started running errands for Paul Vario. He got his cigarettes, coffee, and delivered messages. Paul didn't have a phone. He hated phones. He even told Henry to never put his name on anything, at least not his real name. At age 13, Henry was selling fireworks, which were illegal. He was also doing what was called cashing. He'd go store to store with a counterfeit 20 and buy something for a dollar or two dollars to get legitimate money back. At age 14, Henry was making more money than his father, who was an electrician. One day Henry got home from a pizza joint and his father was waiting for him with his belt in one hand and a letter in the other. The letter was from the school's truant officer. Henry got a terrible beating. It was so bad that night that the next day, the guys wanted to know what happened. After he told them, they kidnapped the mailman and told him all of Henry's mail was to be sent to the pizza parlor. That was it. No more letters from truant officers. At age 16, Henry was arrested for the first time for credit card fraud. And at the age of 17, Henry decided to take a break from the mob and join the paratroopers. But the so-called break didn't last very long. All he did was go back to his old mob ways. He sold excess food, did loan sharking, and distributed alcohol. He was eventually discharged from the army for getting into a bar fight and stealing a sheriff's car. <laughs> Henry was a wild guy. When he got out of the army, he went back to work for Paul again. He was given a free union card for Brick Lane. He originally got the card at age 14, but um, he didn't really use it. How these scams work is a mob guy or connected guy is given a union card as a means of paying for protection. The mob guy doesn't even have to show up for work and still get to collect a check. There were a number of scams. 
Henry said they were doing a hundred scams a day. They had stolen card rings, credit card scams, protection rackets, loan sharking, gambling, gun running, and drugs. Drugs were prohibited in the mob, so such deals had to be kept secretive. You'd think with all the money rolling in that mob guys would be living large. The fact was that mob guys never saved their money. They gambled, they partied, they drank, they paid for hookers, they took care of their girlfriends and their wives. Henry's financial state would shift from the black to the red in a matter of hours. Within a few days after a major robbery, he was borrowing money again. There are several sections of the book devoted to Henry and his wife Karen. They were quoted on how they met, when they went out, and when they got married. It's an interesting courtship. Karen mentions her impressions of the wives of mobsters. She said some of the women were disheveled, their kids were wild and always in trouble. She said the women talked about jail. They made jail very real. They knew the good prisons and the bad ones, but they never talked about what their husbands had done to get sent to jail. Henry ran with Paul Vario's crew. A couple of these members stand out because they were closest to Henry. One was Jimmy Burke, the other was Tommy DeSimone. Both men were vicious killers. Jimmy, also known as Jimmy the Gent, was placed in a foster home at an early age. He was beaten and sexually abused. He never knew his real parents, nor where or when he was born. He was in and out of dozens of foster homes. He started his life of crime at age 14. Henry said Jimmy was the kind of guy who cheered for the crooks in movies. Jimmy had a reputation for being wild. He'd whack you. Also, Jimmy loved to steal. You could offer Jimmy $1 billion not to steal. He'd turn you down and then try to figure out how to steal the billion dollars from you. Stealing was the only thing he enjoyed. As for Tommy D. Simone, he was an out-of-control psychopath who loved to kill. Henry said, I don't know how many people Tommy killed. I don't even think Tommy knew. One night Tommy shot a kid named Spider in the foot because the kid didn't want to dance. On another night, Tommy wanted Spider to dance again, but the kid told Tommy to fuck off. Tommy put three shots into Spider's chest. Henry said, it didn't take anything for these guys to kill you. They liked it. Henry and the guys were involved in some major heists. One was the Air France heist, which netted Henry $480,000. Henry said, Air France made me. No one had ever pulled that kind of cash out of the airport before, and I did it without a gun. It started with a tip from a cargo foreman, Bobby McMahon, or Frenchie. One day he tells Henry about a large sum of money coming in and that it would be in $60,000 packages and placed in a secure room at John F. Kennedy International Airport. There, two keys. Frenchie had one, and a guard from a private agency had another. One key for each door. So they had to get a copy of the other key. So they hired a hot-looking hooker to keep the other guy busy while they copied the key. The great thing about this heist was the money was untraceable. This was one of the high points in their criminal careers. One incident, though, changed their carefree criminal lives, and it was the result of Tommy's psychopathic temper. One night, made man Billy Batts joked with Tommy. He asked if Tommy still shined shoes. The last time Billy saw Tommy is when Tommy was a kid, now, you couldn't joke around with Tommy, but also you couldn't kill a made man unless it was sanctioned by the boss, but Tommy didn't care. A couple weeks after this embarrassing incident, Tommy killed Billy in Jimmy's club. Henry said, we had a problem. Billy Batts was untouchable. If the Gambino family ever found out that Tommy killed Billy, we were all dead. As Jimmy, Tommy, and Henry were driving Billy's body to a remote spot to bury him, 
they heard a thumping sound coming from the trunk. Billy was still alive. So they stopped the car and beat him with a shovel until he was finally dead. Then they buried him. About three months later, they had to dig up Billy's body and move it. Henry said the smell was so bad, he vomited the whole time. Henry first went to prison after getting into a barroom brawl with a man whose sister was a typist for the FBI. It started as a lark. He went to Florida with Jimmy and Casey to pick up some gambling money that was owed to Casey. When they find the man, things escalated and Henry beat the man with a gun. Henry said, I whacked him across the face with the gun a few times. I didn't really want to hurt him so bad. The man Henry beat up was John Siaccio. When his sister saw him, she freaked out. At first, Henry and the guys were indicted for kidnapping and attempted murder, but they beat those charges. But the feds came back after them with an extortion indictment. They were sentenced to 10 years. Since Casey died of a heart attack, it was Jimmy and Henry who served. Now, I don't know who Casey is, but... Um, he was just one of the guys. Henry didn't go to prison right away. As a result of several appeals, almost two years elapsed between the time of his sentencing and when he finally surrendered. In the meantime, Henry was a one-man crime wave. First, he borrowed money from loan sharks. He never intended to pay it back. Then, he moved truckloads of swag at discount rates. Swag is goods acquired by unlawful means. He traded stolen and counterfeit credit cards, sold liquor and fixtures to bar owners, and ran up huge bills with creditors. He didn't care. While in prison, Henry continued his criminal ways. He sold drugs. There was a thriving pot, pills, and coke market. He got Karen to smuggle in pot, hash, coke, meth, and quaaludes. Henry gamed the system by using various special rehabilitation programs and the use of good time, or time out for good behavior. By doing this, he got released after only serving four years. Once he was out on the streets again, Henry came back to crime with a vengeance. He had a crew of his own who sold drugs, guns, jewels, and liquor. He also got involved in basketball fixing. Henry and some other gamblers got involved in basketball point shaving. They convinced Rick Cohn, a Boston College rebounder, to intentionally lose games by a specific number of points. The mob made hundreds of thousands of dollars off this scheme. Henry made over 100000 all by himself. The biggest scheme Henry and Jimmy's crew were involved in was the Lufthansa heist. Henry was out of prison only two months when he first heard about Lufthansa. His bookmaker, Paul Marty Krugman, first told him about the possibility of the score. He said there were millions of dollars in untraceable $50 and $100 bills sitting in a cardboard vault at Kennedy Airport just waiting to be robbed. On Monday, December 11, 1978, the heist took place. It was done brilliantly. The robbers knew about the double-locked two-door security arrangements in the four-foot-thick cinder block vault rooms. They knew about the silent wall alarm system inside the safe. They knew that if you opened the door to the second vault, where the money and jewels were stored without closing the outer door, a silent alarm would be sounded at the Port Authority's police office about a half mile away. In the end, the robbers stole $5 million in cash and $875,000 in jewels. It was the single most successful cash robbery in the nation's history up to that point. It was the heist of a lifetime. It was the one robbery where there should have been enough for everyone. Yet within days of the robbery, the dream score turned into a nightmare. What should have been the crew's happiest moment turned out to be the beginning of the end. Henry wasn't directly involved in the heist, and he didn't profit off of it, even though it was his connection that made the heist happen in the first place. 
It turns out that he made the right choice because Jimmy started getting paranoid. He was already planning on murdering everyone involved and keeping their share. The first to get whacked was Stax Edwards, the black guy who drove the getaway van. He was supposed to take the van to get it compacted, but he got stoned and went home to sleep. The police found the van with ski masks, a leather jacket, fingerprints, and a footprint of a Puma sneaker inside. Tommy took care of the hit on Stax. The next to get whacked was Marty, the guy who gave them the score in the first place. Henry said, murders never bothered Jimmy. He started doing them as a kid in jail for old mafiosi. Marty kept hounding Jimmy for his cut of the heist. Jimmy got sick of him and had him killed. Tommy got whacked for killing Billy Bats. Polly set it up that Jimmy was going to be a made man when in reality he was ambushed and killed. Things were starting to really fall apart. In 1980, Henry was arrested for drug trafficking. He had Karen, his wife, and a girlfriend who helped him deal drugs. He kept seeing a police helicopter hovering above him and following him everywhere he went. Sure enough, he got busted. After his arrest, Henry was in a state of limbo. He knew he couldn't go back to his old life, but at the same time, all he knew was crime. But he also knew that he and his family's lives were at stake. Henry was too vulnerable. He was facing too much time for a guy like Jimmy to take any chances with. Everybody Henry knew had turned their back on him. He had no choice but to cooperate. On May 27, 1980, Henry Hill officially decided to cooperate. He signed an agreement with the U.S. Justice Department. He told them everything, what they did, how they did it, who they bribed, etc. Henry implicated Paul Vario, Jimmy Burke, and countless others. His testimony led to 50 convictions. After the trial, Henry and his family entered the Witness Protection Program. They changed their names and were moved to different locations. In 1990, Martin Scorsese directed the film Goodfellas based on the book. I recommend watching the movie in conjunction with this book. So in conclusion, most mafia men either spend life in prison or they are killed. Henry was a lucky one. Thank you for watching. Bye.